What's going on, running fans, jumping fans, throwing fans, all around athletics fans. Welcome to Talking in Ovals. I'm Alex Cuesta, my partner in crime over there, Dave Hyatt. What's going on, brother? U.S. Nationals are now done. It's it's uh, going to be interesting to see how we do at Worlds as a USA. I thought it was pretty cool today that a thing Moose said, I'm not going 15. So girl who got fourth place steps in and goes. I'm, I'm glad that she didn't make her wait. I, I thought that was a pretty classy move. And uh, we're going to go. It's going to be interesting to uh, see, you know, who gets picked for the four by one relays, four by four relays as, you know, the alternates to, to run on those legs. And let's go. We had some pretty good and exciting races. It was, you know, it's almost like the tree in the woods, though. If uh, two of the days weren't on TV, did they even actually happen? But we'll get into that a little bit later because that I know is certainly a topic that I think grinds everyone's gears that oh, yeah. ever been involved with any sort of running. But before we get started, like, share, follow, subscribe, rate five stars on Spotify and iTunes. Spread this word of mouth. Find us on socials. Go look up Talking in Ovals. You'll see the logo. We are there. We interact. We say hi. Say hi back. And today is Monday, July 10th of 2023. That's when we are recording. So, hi. Last week, we had another first on this show. We had our first ever high school athlete, and uh, I don't think we could have gotten any luckier for having Emma Zawatsky on. She is a rising mm-hmm. senior over in Freehold Township, and man, we could not have had a better first guest in terms of a high schooler, and she was fantastic. Everyone should go. Um, she has a TikTok where she interviews other uh, you know, pro athletes and things like that, so please go support her there. And- she was actually out at Hayward Field. She was out of here. Her brother was throwing in the U20. Yeah. So talented family, really, uh, really good person. Go back and listen to that episode and support Emma. She's going to have a fantastic career. Um, This week, we have no PBs, no PRs. Um, We had a week off. If you want to see some PRs, you should have definitely went and watched either Jamaican Nationals or U.S. Nationals. There was enough fireworks. Um, So definitely go there. And we're going to jump into this show right away this week, Dave. This week, we have our guest, Vicki Huber Rudowski. She's a two time Olympian, eight time NCAA champion, and a one time United States champion. Vicki, what's going on? Hey, how are you guys? Good, good. How is everything going with you? Everything's good. It's, uh, it's, Weird to be interviewed. It feels like all that happened so long ago. You know, it's like, you know, I'm ancient history now. You had a high schooler on last week and then you have an old timer on this week. We love to mix it up. Like we just pay homage to to everyone who came before you. And it's an absolute honor. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we just we want to have anyone. We want to have the greats. We want to have just casual runners. We want to have high school, college, pro, current, former pro, because, uh, you know, part of our mission for starting the show is that our runners don't get enough exposure. We don't have enough exposure. It's only when, you know, you're an amazing, great, you get big time exposure and very regional, small coverage, even when you're great in our sport. So the goal is to get you guys more exposure and even, you know, like Dave said, pay homage to the people that paved the way for all of us. So I want to jump in right there. Hold on, Alex. I have to give a shout out really quick to one of our former guests, Jeff yes. Benjamin. Oh, yes. Jeff. Getting the, the uh, Jeff Dunaway Award for Journalism Excellence. I mean, he, the guy has a vast knowledge of the sport. He's a great he's a great ambassador. And I mean, he forgets more about track than most people will ever know. And it's it's just so great that he got that honor and it's so well deserved. And he's yes. everywhere. He's everywhere. He like I don't know how he like pops up everywhere and gets pictures with all all the great runner. Yeah, athletes. he's like, oh, here's a pic with Seb Co. Here's a pic with uh, <laughs> Eamon Coglin. It's like, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. I, I think it's easy because once you talk to Jeff, you realize his passion for the sport and you yeah. realize why he's there. You realize that he's there because he loves the sport. And if Jeff writes an article about you, then it's pretty special because Jeff is a great dude. So yes, good call, Dave. He absolutely deserves that. So Let's jump back to Vicky, though. Vicky, we do a segment at the beginning of all of our shows, and we're throwing you right into that as well. When did you get the spark to really be a runner? When was that aha moment that you can be a runner and do this for the rest of your life type of thing? 
Um, I definitely got a spark for it when I was younger. Um, I did really back in my day, field day was actually field day where you had, you know, races and you competed and high jump. And, you know, if you had a really good gym teacher, they were actually like field day events. So um, I knew I was pretty fast then. And then my brother uh, was is two years older than me and he ran track in junior high and I just idolized him. I wanted to be just like him. So I was finally able to go out for track in seventh grade and first race rolled around and I beat all the ninth graders on my team. And I think that was like, I kind of have pivotal moments in my career. And I think that was a pivotal moment because instead it could have gone either way. Those ninth grade girls could have been mad at me and treated me like crap for beating them. But instead they didn't. And they, they were very supportive and, and, you know, just were happy for me. So, you know, and that, that moment in, in certain people's careers could have gone totally different way and could have ended, you know, a, a future track career. But I, I've always had, um, you know, really good teammates. And so, um, I was able then to uh, hook up with a club in Delaware and um, I had one of the best club coaches back then, you know, I really only had spring track. I played field hockey in the fall. Uh, Indoor track was not a thing for my high school. Um, And so I only had spring track and we didn't do like AAU summer running. Um, So I hooked up with this track club again, great people, great coaches still in a group chat with four people from, from back in the eighties. Um, and that's how I got my full ride to Villanova. And I think just the, um, I think it was also an inner thing where nobody had to tell me how to to tell me to go out and run. My parents never had to say, maybe you should get your run in today, or we're supposed to do a workout today. Never. They never had to tell me that. So I think it was an inner fire and a passion just to, to take this gift I was given by God and turn it into the that just make it the best that I could, I could make it. That's great. And uh, kudos to your, to those ninth graders, because I never understood the older, the upperclassmen or the uh, younger people who got mad or bitter over the younger athlete. Like it's just going to make your team better. So exactly. I mean, I, I never got that. I was all about team when I ran. So, well, that's because you are a guy. You don't, you don't understand girl cattiness. <laughs> I, listen, uh, <laughs> <laughs> true. That is, well, Dave did coach girls for well, a while. I also he was girls, yep. he was in yep. that world with high school girls. And I was gonna piggyback on that though, because uh back in the 80s and things like that, bullying was not as much of a major topic, right? It was there. We always wanted to stop it, but bullying and hazing was much still going on. So it was really cool for a bunch of ninth graders to sit there and not put you down and you know and it does go on i think it still goes on today with the jealousy of that's supposed to be my spot why is this shrimp taking it for me like and Uh, yeah that that didn't occur but i think running is such a different world and we talked about this on the show before where the pain is the same regardless of what position you get as long as you give it your all right so i feel like the respect is different and even some of the minor envy but not in a bad way of wow in seventh grade i couldn't do that but that's pretty cool like yeah so I think like I piggyback, you know, on Dave where, you know, be a good teammate. Anyone young listening out there, please be a good teammate. If somebody's yes. better than you and they're younger than you, say, you know what? Run your workouts with me so we can make you better and you can make me better as a leader. So uh, that that's so cool. That's cool to hear that you had, uh, you know, girls there that were willing to take you under their wing and things like that. Well, yeah. And also this club I ran with one of my biggest competitors, uh, went to a private school. I went to a public school. We trained together all off season and all for, for three years or so. And at at the state meet, I only beat her. Actually, she beat me at the County meet, but tripped me up a little bit. And I ran over my coach and I was like, she should be disqualified. And, And he looked at me and he said, next time, don't let her get so close to you. And so at state meet, I beat her by five tenths of a second, maybe. And her scholarship to UNC went up from like 30% to 70%. So it was like, you know, everybody won. So it was, it was great. We really helped each other be the best we could be. And we're still friends to this day. Now, Dave hated every other person that didn't have the same thing went on as as him in high school. That's how my coach was. That's how my coach was. Did you, outside of, you know, her, obviously, (laughs) because you obviously trained with her. Were you kind of looking at the other girls, though, as lunch because you didn't know them? Or was it still more of a friendly atmosphere, even though you were competitors? I think, um, well, it was more like 
and from my small state of Delaware, it was almost like that private school, public school fight, you know? So we were, that that still exists. (laughs) Yeah. So we were the scrappy public school, Concord high school, you know, and then there was like the, the, the private, the private schools. And so I think it was, (laughs) uh, that was the rivalry, you know? So if it, and unfortunately, I mean, because there was one girl from a, a private school that did join us um, that we didn't really know very well. And now we're friends. We both coach. And one day I was just like, I am so sorry. I know we were mean to you. Like we would be out on a long run and we would be like, let's run her into the ground, you know, type of thing. <laughs> so we were mean. And uh, so I did the same thing you know, just because she was from the private school yep. that we, you know, didn't really like. So but, you know let you kind of grow and you let bygones be bygones. And she yeah. said we weren't that mean. So <laughs> that's good. But you know what though, again, it's like kind of every once in a while, you're probably trying to run her into the ground and there she is just going with you. And you're just like, respect. Oh, okay. Respect. Cool. cool. Yep. And may yep. hopefully you got better today and yep. you know, let's go get a PR. Now you're wearing, you're on our team. So it, it, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that's how so, running is. I mean, it's yeah. not up to some coach to decide who's better. The times don't lie. Absolutely. So I was doing some, research prior to you coming on and on your Wikipedia page. Um, it sounds like from this, your career with your coach at Villanova did not have the greatest start. Is that accurate? Oh my God. I think he really tried very hard to make me um, transfer my freshman year. That's kind um, of how it sounds. <laughs> yeah. He, uh, so I went to school two weeks before I started um, and I had started packing everything and my field hockey stick was coming with me to Villanova. And uh, two weeks before school started, he said, so you ready for cross country? And I was like, no, no, I've never run cross country. Didn't we talk about me running fall track? And I pictured myself like out on the turf playing hockey with some of the girls during the fall season. And he's like, no, you're running cross country. And I panicked because I had gained a little weight over the summer. I had eaten some ice cream at work. I, your summer uh, training, right? <laughs> yeah, I just was running 30 minutes a day. And uh, so I got there and he, I started the workouts and I was crying and finishing last in time trials. And he came up to me one day and he said, you know what, no matter how, he didn't say the word crappy you run. He said another word, but he was like, no matter how crappy you run, you're running cross country. This isn't regulated. You could say what you want here. <laughs> okay. So he said, no matter how shitty you run, you're running cross country. So um, I just was like, oh, that's it. And on, <laughs> our first meet was at University of Maryland. And I accidentally tripped Maryland's top girl on a cobblestone <laughs> path. And Rosalind Taylor was right there. I don't know if you guys know Rosalind Taylor. I know. And the I name. thought, they're going to kick my ass when we go around that lake behind those trees. And I just put my head down and ran and I won the whole race. Wow. And, yeah. And my coach was like, what the hell was that? My parents were like, what the hell was that? You've been crying every day for like the past month. And I was even like, what yeah, the hell was that? Like, I was scared. I was scared. <laughs> Sometimes death. I they were going to kill great me. Things. <laughs> so I ended up uh, being third or fourth girl, you know, that year we made it to NCAAs and um, I d- had a love hate relationship until about my junior year in at Villanova with cross country. And then I just fell in love with it. So, so prior to you having that breakout race at Maryland, was there any thoughts of transferring and getting out of there? Or was it something where you set your mind that, you know, you're going to succeed at this ha- no matter how difficult it is? <laughs> I think it wasn't a thing like nowadays people are like, I don't really like it. I'm going to transfer to another school and they start talking to coaches. I felt very lucky to just be on a full scholarship to Villanova. My parents didn't have money for college. So for me, it was like I either quit track and I go to Del- University of Delaware because they could afford maybe the tuition yeah. Um, yeah. or just keep going and just, you know, and actually that summer when I came home that after my freshman year, I got really close to making NCAAs. Um, and so I was at my waitressing job and I just one day said, you know what? You did pretty okay for crying the whole entire year. So just stop <laughs> your crying, you know, just shut up and run and, and stop your whining. And well, that's what happened. And then soft me. I'd, uh, I'd say it turned out well, you won the uh, eight, NCAA championships. So I think it, uh, I think, you know, and I'm sure that you can attribute a lot of that to running cross country seriously. I'm sure that that helped you for every, for every other season too. Just like it does I, I say, everyone. yeah, cross country and Gina Procaccio, because Gina Procaccio was one of those teammates that was like, stop your mind and just shut up and run. And uh, so it, it really, she did help me out. So I, I, I toughened up is what I needed to do. 
And not to mention that like finishing with a Villanova diploma is very nice as well because yeah. it's a very, you know, very Stage good education good. school. Uh, you know, Villanova diploma goes far. So that had to be a little bit of motivation, even though if Udell is your fallback, that's still another fantastic school educationally. So it's like that's it's not a terrible fallback in terms of if you had to transfer out. <laughs> it's when, not. It's not. But when you're a Delaware uh, resident, it is yeah. like back in the day, like if you didn't get into any other school, you went to Delaware. Now it's hard to get into. Delaware, even if you live in Delaware. Yes, it is. That's so, cool. um, yeah. So now when, when you were there in, in college, you were very good, but the girls team, it was just about to get really good as, as you progressed. Yeah. But the, but the men's team was, was always very, very good. Right. Were, yes. were you there when like uh, Marcus was there, Marcus O'Sullivan, were you guys there together at all? Marcus had just graduated. So it was yeah. like Sean O'Neill, Jerry O'Reilly, um, Sydney Marie had graduated, but he lived there. So he would come in and work out on the track. So we got to watch Sydney work out. Charlie yeah. Jenkins was there. Um, uh, Bruce Harris actually uh, was another Delawarean that was there. Nice, um, nice. I'm trying to think of some other uh, Tony Valentine, uh, Grant mm -hmm. Davis, you know, it's they fit so many legendary athletes and coaches on the men's side, you know, like you know, Elliot and now, uh, and now Marcus is doing, you know, an, an oh. amazing job, but you know, yeah. but like, you know, you were like the first kind of big female star. And then you, you started all with the NCAA XE titles. And then I think they won like six straight women's titles or, or yeah, after that first like that. one, I, yeah. I think yeah. they won six and then there were a couple of years where they didn't and they won six more in a row. And then, you know, so it's, yeah, they've, they've it's been amazing. That's awesome. So do and, you yeah. feel like your success kind of paved the way uh, like we're uh, like, you know, part of what you were able to do help pave the way to get those high level recruits that would build that. Um, do you kind of look at what you did as like the foundation of part of those six years? Yeah, I do. And I, I think that um, I think that really what solidified it was when Terrence Mahan was actually on a visit. Um, he was transferring from he was out in California, I think. And he said the reason why he wanted to come to Villanova was because of me and, and how my career had gone at Villanova. So um, I was cool. pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's pretty cool. So I want to go a little bit in the way back machine with you. I want you to give me some of your favorite memories from running. Going back, you know, we talked a little bit about seventh grade, you know, winning that race. Uh, we just touched a little Nova. Kind of fit us in between there. What are some of your best memories that kind of, you know, shaped you as the runner you would become? And ultimately, you know, I think all of us could say running helps shape us as people. Um, it really does. It challenges you and it pushes you in ways that you can't even imagine. Um, so take us some good memories that you had from you know seventh grade if you have any more all the way up to college and pro i think um my track workouts that with that club were some of my greatest memories we worked out um we met at a track at 5 30 at night because everybody all the it was it everybody from like 14 to 85 i mean that's how big wow. the, the club was um and it just was all ages so we would meet after people did their day at work um, and we would warm up together and we'd be running in the dark. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but running in the dark just makes you seem faster, right? You're always faster. You feel so much quicker. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and it, it, like, it just makes you feel like I'm putting in extra work. I'm, I'm running when people aren't, aren't running. Like, I'm exactly. Not like Every, so it's like at a home watching TV. Yep. And, yeah. Yep. So, um, those workouts were great. And then, um, we used to play Sunday morning tag games at Brainwine Creek state park, which is a local park. And it was like a game of war. Like one person would be it. We'd all fan out around the park and, you know, it was, if you did, if you were it, you didn't catch anybody. It was like, oh man, you just got, you know, destroyed the whole rest of, you know, that week with people picking on you for being a loser, but, but it was all in good fun. And, um, and like I said, those, those, people from that group are still some of my, my uh, best friends, my friend, Dan, um, he, sometimes my coach would make me run tempo runs with him. And I, that looking back was such a pivotal thing for me because he was so good. And, and that last like mile of a three mile tempo run, I hated Dan so bad because I was hurting <laughs> so bad, but I had to finish. And I'll tell you what, in that last lap of the Olympics in the 3000, I was hurting so bad, but I had been there with Dan in my, in earlier in my training. So I think that's why I was able to handle it. Otherwise I don't think I would have finished the race. I mean, it was, it, so that was really important. It was fun. It was really important. Um, so kudos Dan for helping Vicky yes. get through that. He last knows. I told him the other day. Yeah. Kudos. I hated him, but it, he was in, an integral part in my career. Um, <laughs> 
obviously the Olympics, um, the 88 Olympics in Seoul, I was 21, didn't know anything, just young and stupid. So I had so much fun and still it ran well. Um, I had a lot of fun. Um, the World Cross Country Champs, I mean, again, that was a huge stage and it snowed in Boston. And uh, uh, what else just- is new? Right. I mean, the night before. What, so. what else is new? If, it, if it's cross country and there's a championship to be had in Boston. In March. You snow on the ground somehow. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> August. Yeah, I know. Could have exactly. Um, and that was fun. I got to go to New Zealand. I got uh, I was able to be a part of like a two week trip to because it was what it's their summer, our winter. So they mm-hmm. beat up on the Americans a little bit. Um, but I got to see New Zealand and I love that country. I, I would love to go back. The people are the nicest people in the entire world. Um, Nike photo shoots. Uh, I got to go to Japan with a USA group, uh, Roger Kingdom, Evelyn Ashford. Wow. You know, I got to go over with them. Um, and also uh, towards the end of my career, moving to Eugene in uh, 96. My daughter was eight months old and we moved in with um, a family, my friend Chris and Jeff and their three daughters. And um, and her parents are right, right around the corner. And we we developed another whole entire family in Eugene. So we have gone back to the trials every four years so that they've been in Eugene to stay with our Eugene family and uh, be able to, to visit with them. And it's just, it's just, you know, it's been a blessing. Running has been such a blessing in my life. So what was it like winning your first nationals? Um, you know, you won nationals, at, you know, in college uh, in the, what was it in the 1500, right? You went over there and won. What was that like? Uh, winning the USA championship at that time. Did you feel like your career was going to like, how did you feel your career was going to shape after that? I was always like, uh, well, so when I won the 1500, it was an Olympic year. Mm -hmm. So the thing was, well, people are focused on the trials, not so much the USA championship. So I didn't really, my biggest kudo was Alyssa Harvey was in the race. So, you know, that's enough. So winning it with her in the race made it obviously super legit. Yeah. Um, but I think it was just like a stepping stone. So for me, it was like, okay, you're legit, you know, so going in and there was a little speed work going into th- the 3000, I was qualified for the Olympic trials if I needed to, you know, fall back on that. Um, so it was a good stepping stone for me, but definitely nothing that I rest. I never rested my laurels on anything really. So yeah, talk about now going to the Olympics. Now we've talked to some Olympians and I just want to get your reaction. What was it like going through the ceremony? having you a USA singlet and being able to compete for the United States. What was that? Has that feeling like ever been, uh, have you ever had an equivalent to the first time you experienced that? No, I mean, it was amazing. I'm so every time the national anthems played at anything, soccer games, wherever we are, high school games or, um, you know, I, I just go back to being um, being in that in those shoes of representing the United States. And that's always been important to me, representing Villanova, representing my high school, representing my family, my teammates, like representing, uh, you know, the, my team, no matter what team it is, um, is very important to me. Um, I will say that wearing a cardigan in August in Seoul or in <laughs> September. I mean, sometimes the uniform choices of the, right. the opening ceremony. Like, this is not the winter Olympics. This <laughs> yeah. is the summer Olympics. And yeah. how does team USA not have alternates? Like we're going to go with the cardigans, but if it's 700 degrees in Seoul, maybe we'll switch the polos. a little bit. It Still was so hot. <laughs> we were dripping by the time we walked into the stadium. Cause you're standing outside for three, for six mm-hmm. hours, you know, United yeah. States were at the very end. Um, so I do understand why a lot of people skip the opening ceremonies and I, I do, you know, people that don't know, or like, how could you skip the opening ceremonies? Well, if you have a, if you have a competition the next day, yeah, absolutely. you know, it's a long, long day, but going into the stadium and I actually, uh, my teammate from Villanova, Jerry O'Reilly was there with, with, um, for Ireland. We actually met on the infield, which there's all these athletes out there. So it was just, it was just wild and crazy. Um, so it, uh, the other thing was that year in 88, Kappa did the uniforms. Oh, yeah. Um, so that's we're talking a long time ago. Uh, and <laughs> they uh, they weren't the best fitting, best cut uniforms. So um, I think there was one 400 trial race and all the girls ended up with like wedgies at the end of the race. So we all got a little notice, like, please don't wear the bodysuit. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it's not a good look. Um, Mary Slaney had had her Kappa uh, singlet uh, altered because it was a very high. It was, and I was like, man, like, 
why couldn't we all do that? Like, no, I didn't get that memo. So, uh, but, but regardless, um, marching into that stadium in a USA uniform was just, uh, it was definitely overwhelming. I'll give you that much. Um, I almost blacked out at the starting line. Wow. Just with the, it all hit me all at once. And I was like, oh crap. And then the gun went off. So, um, I didn't have too much time to think, but probably good timing for that gun, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, your body yeah. just started reacting. <laughs> I, I almost, if you watch the race, I'm in last place when the gun goes off. Cause I literally think I, I almost just like fainted, like, wow. wait, <laughs> I'm not ready for this yet. <laughs> so, I have a, a question for you. So you're, you're in the middle of your college career. You go to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Um, was that commonplace thing? Because I feel like nowadays um, these athletes, whether they're freshmen or sophomores, they just sign, sign, sign pro, and then they go right, right pro. You, you see it happen like with Will, Will Sumner. Sumner, who just yeah. he was a freshman, or Britain, the uh, 400 girl from um, Arkansas. You? Arkansas. Oh, Arkansas. Um, yeah. so like, was that common then to go back to your college, or was there pressure to go to the next level in pro, or did you feel that you can get the same training going back to college that you could have maybe going? pro at that time it's a whole different world now with these training groups i mean there were very few training groups for women um so i think that uh everybody it sort of was kind of commonplace to say you know what you stay with your team and even people that graduated would stay like on the you know villanova campus and you know and this so they kind of stayed where their where their coaches were um also you couldn't make the money that these athletes are making there was now they've got nil and all that stuff but you would lose your amateur status so um you couldn't make any when i went to new zealand um i was i made no money um you know per race because i was um no i was pro i made 500 dollars a race but when i went to europe uh in 88 before the olympics i made no money i had my trip paid for but i could not make money in those races that's crazy it's I know and that's just, you know, and it's funny too, because we had Sarah Slattery on one of our earlier episodes and even her in, you know, the nineties, like two thousands, she was talking about how difficult it was yeah. to really find, you know, training groups. And I feel like that's been, we're slowly evolving as a sport because away groups it, are common. It, yeah. But it's like, we still have a long way to go. And we'll definitely, I definitely want to talk to you more about the sport later and how far we have to go. So she, as a female perspective because I, I i feel like it's definitely gotten much much better from a, a female perspective I, than maybe in the 80s and, and i'm so jealous i'm so jealous of the female athletes of, of these days i i do massage and I, I do work on a lot of the high school kids in the area and one kid when he's like did you have a tough time deciding what training group to go to after you graduated and i was like no there wasn't a choice well, I, didn't my have one. I called my coach <laughs> at villanova and said well you still coach me please like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i basically- trained by myself <laughs> You know, I really, I really did train by myself. So even though you're envious, I feel like there is a lot of female athletes that we be envious of a later part of your career. You have your daughter in 95 and then you decide that I want to go make the Olympics again and you succeed. What was that like? Because, you know, me and Dave are guys. And it was in our own country. It was in Atlanta. It was in Atlanta, but like me and Dave are guys. I don't know what it's like to give birth. I watched my wife do it twice. I (laughs) can't imagine her sitting there going, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna make to go and be an elite athlete again. (laughs) I'm I'm I never gave birth and I'm done being an elite athlete a long time ago. It's like, (laughs) so what was that like? And was it a difficult decision so close after you had your daughter to then go and really engage in that type of training again? So um, when I was pregnant with Alyssa, I was also, um, before I found out I was pregnant, I started kind of working and consulting with Dick Brown. So then through the pregnancy, my pregnancy, Dick Brown said, you know, Vicki, I think after you have your baby, I think you have a good chance of, of coming back. And um, so I was kind of like, and eh, eh, my life is a little bit in shambles. Um, I, I got divorced. Um, so I came home to Delaware. Um, I moved in with my parents, my mom and dad. And I went to them one day, MBNA was, a, you know, a, a bank here and they had just started and I had heard they had daycare in their premises on the premises. And I thought I should go work for MBNA, but I still have this itch that I need to scratch. And so I talked to my parents and I said, I really, I really want to do this. And they, they said, we will support you. I mean, not that like they'll, you know, pay me or whatever, right, but right. they were like, we'll, we'll help you. Yeah. And um, so I started, I started running. I didn't gain a ton of weight with Alyssa. Um, so, 
and I waited appropriate amount of time. So I started running again and slowly building up a base and I, I felt pretty good. It came back pretty quickly. And, um, and I was working and I also believe it or not, uh, one day I was working at a family owned produce market and my, my now husband is a physical therapist and he came to the market and said, Hey, Vicki, I hear you're training again. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, come to our clinic. We'll help you out however we can. Now, mind you, at this point, I had never what had a pickup massage. lines. That was I a know, right? pickup line right there. Come to my <laughs> I was, clinic. I got you. <laughs> listen, I was nursing at the time. So I, my boobs were actually, you know, kind of. Not <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you were so picking anyway, up and so was he. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the first time I had massage. It was kind of the first time I really got like kind of taken care of as an athlete because again, Villanova back in the day, uh, Villanova basketball, we sort of got kicked out of the training room whenever a guy's team came in. Yeah. So we didn't have a lot of, uh, a lot of people taking care of us. So Rudy, my husband, Rudy, um, who wasn't my husband at the time, but he helped me out a lot. And then one day in November, I got a phone call from my friend, Chris in Oregon, where I had lived. And she said, what are you doing? Your coach is out here in Oregon. There's a training group here. She said, um, you got to come out here. And I said, Oh, remember I have this baby and my parents are helping me out. And she said, I'll be your nanny for a year, move out here, live, live with us. And I'll be your oh. nanny. And I wow. said, no, nope, I can't. I didn't know her that well. I was like, I don't know you well enough for that. I can't do that. She said, pray about it. So I prayed about it. It was like the eight ball. Just every time I turned the eight ball over, it said, yes, oh. yes, yes. <laughs> Go. So Alyssa was eight months old and I boarded a plane. My dad was, I cried all the way to Denver because my dad was crying so hard carrying Alyssa in the, in the car seat, you know, into the super shuttle. He couldn't even drive me. He was crying so hard. And, um, and I went out to Oregon and, Join the training group. And I'll tell you, after training by myself for all that time, those first two weeks, I was running out of my head just to have people to train with. It was the best. <laughs> the world. And then reality kind of hit in the heart, you know, then it got hard. But, but you know, like, I had Susie Hamilton, Claire Taylor, Claire Eichner Taylor. That'll, that'll um, rejuvenate you, you know, to have uh, other people around. It was amazing. And any day at Hayward Field back in that day, you would have Maria Matola. Um, uh, Bill Dellinger would be out on the track. Alberta Very Salazar important. might show up. You'd have the U of O team. Like you'd have the grandma doing her power walking around lane six. Like if the track was open to everybody and anybody, but you could have five Olympians on that track while you were working out. And it was just a great time to be at Hayward field. It was how much, awesome. how much did training alone and doing hard workouts and things alone so often help you with the training group? Cause you kind of find out a lot about yourself when you work out alone, right? It's real easy to just slow down. It's real easy to just stop when you get exhausted and, you know, pushing it is like something that is like, it's hard to do. It is. It so is. What was that like now that when you had other athletes next to you, was it still difficult, but it's like, at least I have someone with me to roll with me now. Was there like even relief in those hard moments. <laughs> it was such a relief. Claire and I became really good training partners. And um, I love Claire. Alyssa's um, middle name is Claire. Um, it's, it was like, it, like if I was having a bad day, Claire didn't run me into the ground. If Claire was having a bad day, like I helped her through, like it was great to have again, that team. I'm a, I love being part of a team. So it was great to be part of a team again and have people to not to have it just be on me all the time, like to push myself. I mean, I still talk to myself and I know it's because I spent so many times just out on a track, just, just one more, you can do it. Like so who wins an argument between you and you? Um, usually me. <laughs> 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 I mean, 96, like you had some, you had like Gina Jacobs was, was on, on top of her game. Amy Wickets knows. So like, you know, just to get top three was a big, big accomplishment at that point. And you, Julie Henner, right. Julie oh, yeah, Henner yeah. was, you know, Susie, she, did, did Susie Hamilton run? She did. She made the team in the eight and then she yeah. came back in the 15. We were all the, the 1500 final. I had so many Villanova teammates in that final. It was ridiculous. It was a mostly Villanova final. So, so Debbie talk- Grant Marshall, uh, Kathy Franey, Sherry Goddard, um, I, Nena Lynch might have been in there. That's Me, awesome. I mean, crazy. <laughs> so I want to talk right before the 15, though, because you ran the 5K. I did. And you didn't finish and you were having, you know, dehydration troubles and things like that. Mm-hmm. What went into the decision to do the 15 after that? Was there kind of like doubt in type of, you know, where you were at that point, if you were able to actually do it. Like, so talk about what happened in the 5k and then what was the decision to run that 15? 
So I think part of what happened to 5K is that I just hadn't run enough of them. So I ran fast enough to make the trials. My training was basically 5K training, but I had also run it. So eight years after my 407.4 PR in the 1500, I ran a 407.9 and I basically like dead stop behind Slaney and had to go around her in Canada. And so I probably would have run a PR. So I was doing really well in the 1500. Um, but all my training was geared to the five, I, but I think it was a lack of, lack of experience. And so, um, somewhere along, like with 600 meters to go, I literally, it was almost like a big voice said like, stop. And I just, I stepped off the track and kudos, man, Dick Brown didn't really say like, what happened? Or he didn't yell at me. He just was like, you know, are you okay? And, and, um, there's also, uh, another story that goes to this. I was, we were staying in Dunwoody, Georgia at a house, um, because I had Alyssa, my parents were helping me with her. So I wasn't in the hotel, um, the, the hotel downtown or near the track or anything with the track headquarters. So I was really embarrassed, obviously. And so I went out to go running like the next day and I'm running down this road in Dunwoody, Georgia. And I see a figure coming towards me and I'm like, oh no, like, but then I'm like, I'm in Dunwoody, who knows? They don't even know who I am. And as the person gets closer, I realize it's Jim Fisher, the coach of University of Delaware, Mm -hmm. who like I'd run into at the mall and, yeah, you know, yeah. whatever. and I'm like, Oh, for the love of God, it's, I know this person <laughs> and he's probably one of the nicest people in the world. I think you guys had Joe Compagni on not too long yeah, ago. Yeah, Joe, We love Joe. Okay. Yeah, one of the nicest people and coach Fisher coached Joe Compagni. That makes uh, sense. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, that well, actually makes Joe, sense. Joe went to, to Delaware. Yeah. Yep. To Delaware. So uh, Jim Fisher's amazing. So, we meet in the middle of this road and on the shoulder and Dunwoody and coach Fisher didn't say what happened. He didn't say, you know, and, and he said, are you okay? And I was like, you know what I am. And that was when I decided to run the 1500 because I, cause he didn't judge me. And so I just, that gave me the courage to go do it. I prayed about it, of course. And, um, I went to, we went to the track. I told Dick Brown, if I couldn't run, uh, if I couldn't break 30 seconds in the, in a 200, I wasn't going to run the 1500. He told me I ran a 29. He could have made it up, but (laughs) that's what coaches do. That's what they do. So I went and ran. We've all done it. My goal it was just to finish the race. I didn't want to drop out again. So I was probably, I think the last person to make like the, you know, through the first round, I was the last person to make it through into the final. I think I was the last person in my heat to make it through. And then, um, in that final, I don't know what happened, but I hadn't broken 207 in an 800 that whole season. And I closed in 205. Wow. I hadn't broken 65 in a 400 and I closed in 60. So I don't know. All I, those, somebody all else those was, workouts alone. <laughs> but it was Susie Hamilton, I guess, right? Yeah. That's what you do when you're training with somebody like that. It was all Dan. It was Dan. <laughs> it sure as heck was Dan. <laughs> and I want to put this out there. You were no slouch in the 5K. You had the 5K national record for road racing for a little while there. So it's not like you were going into a race that was foreign to you. Obviously, road and track are different. Yeah. But you were a decorated 5K runner. It's not like you were you were a very good 5K runner. I was decent, but I, I ran two 5Ks in New Zealand. And I'm telling you what, the 3K was my event. Those last <laughs> five and a half laps. <laughs> I actually wanted to, 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 to uh, talk about that because pre-1988, there was no 5K or 10K, right? No. In, in the uh, uh, Olympics, it was only 15 or the 15 three. How, to, yeah. how happy 15, three, was... 10. How happy was the women's scene when they added the F5? Like, because like, I feel like the F3 and the 15 are, are kind of similar. Like there's not that big, there's not a huge like disparity, uh, disparity in, in those. So like, w- was there a pause? Like, was it something that women at the time were fighting to get in? Like, Hey, we want to have every event that, that the men have or was, or were, were they happy 15, 3, 10? You know, I don't know. Um, that's, I know I wasn't happy because I love the 3000. That to me is the perfect distance. So, um, if I, uh, if I was young enough, I would have loved to have tried the steeplechase because I did hurdles in high school. I think I would have been okay. Um, and I, I love the distance. So I didn't really, um, hear a lot of hoopla about, you know, the equality. I do know that when they took the 3000 out, 
and they put the 5k in it took a long time for them to put the steeplechase in yeah. so um so i think that could have happened faster but um you know i I was so kind of out of the sport ish by then. Right. Um, you know, I, I didn't really hear, I was raising my kids, so I didn't hear a lot of grumblings, but, um, but to me, I was sad because honestly it's the 3000 is the perfect distance. <laughs> so I want to get your opinion on something real quick. Uh, what do you think of women running, doing the heptathlon and not the decathlon? Somebody always, else asked me that. I've always said that, you know, why is it that, you know, at every single turn, it seems that we've had like, no, we need to only let women do these events and protect them. Only let women. And it's, you know, as we've gone, we've been like, no, let women do everything. Like, what's the difference? Like, and we still have the HEP and decathlon. Would you like to see one day women get a decathlon spot? Like, I feel like these multi-event women are more than capable of doing it if they train for it, obviously. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, would, is that something you would like to see one day to kind of get that even playing field as well? Um. I would be interested in asking a heptathlete what they think. Um, we need because, to have on. Yeah, what's, need, what's, yeah need, you have to have a hall on. We need to add a hall on. So, what are the um, what are the three events they don't do? What they don't do? Pole vault. Well, they don't do vaults. Well, obviously the the fifteen is an eight. Is an eight hundred. Eight. I think they uh, do a two hundred rather than a four to end day one. I'm not sure of the actual events that they don't do. Do they do is the, it, It's got to be a throw, right? I, I don't think, know if they do the. Do they? They want to do do Jeff. Maybe I don't think they do jav. I'm not sure. I think they, they do. Don't do, do vault, they don't do jav, and I then know this. one of the jumps, I think. Um, Maybe I don't know. I well, look you look at that. you look at Anna Hall. I'm sure Jackie Joyner would have been fine. Like I, I well, it, it, maybe it's the pole vault. I, you know, I think that it's hard to get women to even pole vault these days still. So yeah. I, I think that that's the biggest hurdle in, in, you know, getting a decathlete is probably that pole vault. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think that that might be a good idea. They don't throw something. discus. They don't. Oh, throw okay. Discus. Yeah. All right. That, that, yeah. I just wanted to get your opinion on that. And I also want to get your opinion on this. So right now we are seeing probably the fastest time in terms of speed and a lot of really fast thresholds being broken. We talk right. all the time about the men, the four minute mile is now just, it used to be a myth. Now it's the requirement. Right. And if you break four back in the day, it was, you're getting a contract. You broke four, you know, you're going to have them come, everyone coming after you. Yeah. Now, if you break four, we had Eric Holt on the show earlier and Eric, you know, was just in the final at USA's, you know, we wish Eric had a better race, but yeah. he was there. Eric right. is a 353 miler and he's unsigned. Like, what is your opinion on right now? You know, you brought up the super shoes and we talked earlier. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel about the super shoes? Do you feel that they give an unfair advantage to athletes right now? Well, I mean, so I guess to phrase it that way, it would, is there an unfair advantage? Well, if everybody's wearing them, then Correct. nobody has an unfair advantage. Yes. Correct. I think the unfair advantage of the unfairness comes in and comparing times like records, like, you know, um, Cap, uh, Caitlin Tui broke Jenny Simpson's 5,000 meter collegiate record, mm, you know, by a second. But if you add the fact that she was wearing super shoes, it, it's probably not even, it's not that it's not close, but she didn't break it. They, they don't, they're not comparable. Those times are not comparable. So pre super shoe, post super shoe, they should be two different, um, two different record books. I mean, when you're taking technology that was went to, a lawsuit with Oscar Pistorius trying to run in the Olympics and trying to decide if he had an advantage because he was running on carbon, right. you know, carbon right. yep. plates. Yeah. And, and then say, Ooh, somebody said, well, look at this, huh? Let's, let's use it in technology in our shoes. I mean, everybody that wears them will tell you it's an advantage. They're running faster in them. In them. I know I wear the speeds. If I want to do a track workout, that's a nylon plate and it's allowing my 56 year old body to do stuff that it probably isn't capable of doing without those shoes. Yeah. I, I think a lot of it too, is that they help you to recover much, much faster. Absolutely. Um, but I also think it's, you know, we have better, better track surfaces, um, especially in indoor track. I mean, the amount of fast indoor tracks now that are banked are huge. And yeah. I think, you know, technology, the internet has played such a huge role because Every coach kind of knows what other coaches are doing. So even if you have a bad coach, you can go online and find something that will work for your athletes. So I think it's so many things that kind of encompass why, you know, kids are running faster. I mean, you know, now you have like, I think, wait, we have four or five kids break four minutes this year in high school. 
Yeah. You know, I think so it was like, more I, than that. I'm not going to lie. I think it was more. Oh, that's, I think it's more. High school. Yeah. But like <laughs> I would go back to the meet at Arcadia. Uh, 76th place in that meet was, was nine flat. It's and ridiculous. And it's Uma, you know, but so, so I'm not, I mean, shoes certainly play a, a role, but I think it, that it encompasses so many more things that are just so much more readily a, a, available at this time. And coaches no more now, you know, there used to be like five or six big time coaches. Now there are coaches. If a high school kid has a bat, you know, he could pay 350 bucks and get workouts sent to him from, oh, yeah. you know, from, from, from all different coaches from, from yeah. all over the world. So definitely shoes, but I just think that there's, that there's so many more things that, that are factors wide. And yes. It's, it's kind of a fun time as a fan, especially if you just started a podcast about a year ago, you know, you, you kind of have all these funny things to talk about, but that's why we love talking to guests of your generation. And just to see, like, it wasn't always easy, you know, like it was a lot harder than guys, like, you know, like just tracks them themselves are so much faster. Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah. The track. Oh my gosh. Like I, the Boston indoor track, you know, and, and every time we go to ocean breeze, I go out and I run a couple laps. Cause I'm like, you guys have no idea how lucky you are to, to have this, you know, track to run on. Yeah. Um, like I ran on a wooden track at Madison square garden. It was, it was 10, <laughs> 10 laps, laps to the mile. mile. <laughs> <laughs> and it was slippery. Uh, sure. And even um, Tonga was the master. I think that okay. also, I think I'm probably a little frustrating as a coach because I do coach high school kids, but I, I'm a little patient. I, I really believe in patience. And I think that, um, one of the reasons why a lot of high school kids are so good is because they're, they do rush it and they're doing a lot. Um, you know, I qualified for junior Olympics out in the uh, LA Coliseum when I was 17 and, uh, during the Olympic trials and my club coach, Joe McNichol, um, he wouldn't let me go. And I was so mad. And he, I said, you don't think I'm good enough. And he's like, no, I know you're good enough. He said, I just, um, I just think that you have such great races ahead of you that there's no reason to do this now. And when I came home from the Olympic games, placing sixth in the final as a 21 year old, I went into a depression for three months because of what it meant, how my life changed. Was I ever going to be good enough again? And if I had to handle that at 17, yeah. I wouldn't have been able to. So um, I think pa a lot of people forget that patience is maybe a good thing uh, sometimes. And you may not get the times when you want to run the times. I talked my kid that I coached into not going to Eugene the uh, summer before his freshman year uh, going into college because he didn't have to set the bar any higher than it was set, you know, like for, like I said, start your freshman year with a 152. Why lower, you know, why run any faster? Go to the lake, enjoy your summer, have fun. You're never going to be 18 again, you know, and, and he's brought it down to 149. So, you know, I just, I think that sometimes these kids have to be kids too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and if you can run fast and be a kid and, and, and be happy and I mean, pressure, the pressure just mounts and, and, um, and it's hard when you're winning and you're doing really well, that pressure and with social media, it's even mm -hmm. exp and everything. It's just yeah. exponential now. And there's so many invitational races now, like, you know, yeah. you like you run with, within your state and maybe you, you'll go to Nationals now, you know, there's meets out in Brooks. There's all, you know, there's the on meets and a lot of these high school kids are going to meet. So it's so many extra races absolutely and and if you don't go you're missing out right like why wouldn't you go why wouldn't you go like we're taking a family trip out to oregon so so-and-so can run you know whatever and they're like 11 and i'm like wow <laughs> my parents would have never could have never done that you and know? you know you touched on something with the patients too and especially as a coach like it has to be difficult in your situation because there used to be a time where you had preseason regular season championship season and you were planning you know get at peak start to taper things like that but now there's pressure early season and every season to run fast run yeah. fast, run fast run fast and i think we saw a good example of some good coaching with a lot of the pros this year because a lot of people were clamoring especially after worlds and how good everyone was we were expecting you know everyone to come out we were expecting like Raven Rogers to come out and just run 156s again and things like that. And we're wanting to see that so often. And I think it's getting pushed down into the lower levels in college and high school. And we are seeing that. I think that could end up being a problem where we're seeing a lot of early season meets with really fast times where really fast. every once yeah. in a while you would get that prodigy to come out, right? And just dominate early season meets because, you know, they were it. They had it and they and a lot of times they burnt out, too. And yeah. that was the thing. And so 
I think I, I think something that you're saying with patience is big. And I also want to touch on one other thing when it comes to the super shoes and the advantages. I think you bring up a tough thing in sports in general because it's tough to kind of say when a record should or shouldn't count, right? Because obviously the cinder tracks were a much less advantage with one inch spikes to the asphalt tracks to the, you know, when Mondo now is a thing and Dave talks about the bank tracks all the time. And it wasn't, you know, I didn't start off running on bank tracks and I was running in the early 2000s. And I was right. on flat right. tracks with no spikes. Right, right. You know, Lehigh, you can never wear spikes. Like, and we were at Princeton in Jersey. Princeton. Like Princeton, yes. you couldn't wear spikes. So, and you know, and it's kind of like, even just to then, should we separate flat track records from bank track records? And it's like, it's a difficult thing. So I think you get that in all sports with baseball. Like, should we count like, you know, some of the things that they used to do in the workouts and football, leather helmets versus... I see. I don't know. It's tough to fall into that. And I get where you're coming from where, but I think it's kind of, it's a weird thing because you can argue with pole vaults and not all schools can afford the same type of poles and there's advantages to certain types. So unfortunately in track equipment matters, but we can't really police the equipment, right? Like it's, it's always tough. It's, you know, if you can afford it, you get the best stuff. And if you can't afford it, you don't, but a bottom line is as long as you have shoes on your feet, you compete. Right. So it's like, I don't know. It it would be tough for me to say, separate these records. Cause then I think we'd have to chop up so much in history. Yeah, it's true. That is true. But, um, you know, kids, like I'll say, what did you run? And they're like, Oh, I ran a four twenty two mile, but it's a four twenty because of the conversion. So now you've got all those conversions, flat track to bank track, you know, conversions. Oh, right. Those conversions don't count. You didn't do it. it. I hate conversions. You didn't do it. That would be like with me, like I'd run a great relay split and it'd be like, let me add three seconds and call it an open. It's like, no, yeah, I, it didn't happen. You didn't do it. You, yes. you didn't do it. Yes. You, had, you had a running start past the line and then you handed it off and hope the guy that was sprinting in front of you got the, <laughs> no, that does not count. I'll take my, I'll take my 428 mile on the mill road track <laughs> yeah, there, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely i mean i mean that i don't like and i say like oh well they would have broke the american record in the 1500 on their way to the mile but they didn't right. run 1500 we- they're in a mile <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah definitely yeah. so how so do I you wanna, feel- oh go, go ahead dave go ahead i just want to ask you you know being at a grad of villanova what is it like running in that villanova uniform at the pen relays because oh they are they are like the most dominant team. I mean, even this year, four by a mile, you know, they come back and win it. Like that four by mile doesn't count. It, <laughs> it does <laughs> not count. They why? Because walk. the anchor legs. Yes, kick. that's not a race. Yeah. You don't give up the lead. That is you a have race. It. it was not a time no. trial. It was a race. It was not. No, but, there was a three man race up front. It was we can a debate race. over that later. <laughs> we can debate over that later. But we boo. We boo now when people like slow down at Penn. Like, yes, it did, they deserve to be booed. That's why, I, but that's why I still kind of like like the championship races because there is no rabbit. Everything's rabbit now. Everything's time trial because I, I that I makes me crazy. Because your sponsorship rabbit. is all based on on time, so everything has to be fast, 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 fast. Like yes. yeah, I feel like we're losing the art of racing. And at a relay race like pin relays, you still have the ability to see that. So, what was it like being at Nova, running at Penn? It's in the same city. It's an amazing meet, and you're wearing that Nova jersey. I mean, ma- male or female yeah that has to be like you know the wall of fame just nova 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 there it's just awesome it's a ton ton of pressure number one it is a ton of pressure so i i remember like um running watching the boys run uh and i think it was like a four by 15 whatever was first and one of the villanova guys kind of like blew it and um, they didn't win. So the next day I was sitting behind these two men, almost like the two old Muppet men in the balcony, you know, and they were watching <laughs> the pen relays. And, uh, and so the same kid that kind of blew it gets the baton. And one of the guys goes, that's the kid that blew it yesterday. And I was like, oh my God, like this, <laughs> these people are like ruthless. So when we were in Seoul on the warm up track, um, Marty and I, before my uh, final in the 3000, uh, I think Marty said, like, Vicky, it could be worse. And I looked at him like, how can it be worse? And he's like, it could be the pen relays. And we just started laughing because it was like, you know what? <laughs> Probably true. <laughs> so was there a rivalry with, uh, you know, UPenn and like Temple? And then when you guys like saw any of them there, was there kind of a rivalry? Like, I have to beat them. I have Still no, no, I'm of like, course, they're going to beat them. But it, was there kind of like, 
you can't lose to them type of deal because you're Villanova. I don't even know to. if they were in our races. We were like Tennessee, yeah. UVA. Um, Every once in a while, they squeaked in Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. No, I think I think Stanford. We, yeah, I mean, in, even back then, really, I think it was it was Tennessee, UVA, um, Wisconsin for sure. Yeah. Um, we wanted to know where Susie was anchoring. Um, Providence, Georgetown. Yeah, Providence. Had some definitely great women seems that definitely. yeah. So those are the ones that we were concerned about. So it was, but it was, um, it was, it was hard. And we we didn't get a hotel room. We like we lived. We went right back to the dorms. We had to like sleep in our dorm room that night. And um, you know everybody knew how we did. And so we had to go back to campus. So it was you either went back as a winner or you went back with your tail between your legs. So, so. with you coaching right now in high school. How much have you had to adjust just the way you would have kind of coached yourself to coaching these young athletes? Because like Dave said, there is such an advantage now where you could sit there and look and find different workouts all over the internet if you need to, and you want to get like different perspectives. Have you changed a lot about you and your philosophy as you've grown as a coach with these young athletes? And what did you take from kind of your old school experience dealing with coaches that were just kind of like, yeah, keep crying while you're running fast. Like what, what, what have you kind of brought there? So they call me coach mom. So that pretty much probably tells you how I coach. Um, I definitely treat these kids like, like they're my kids, which for sure doesn't mean I'm never sarcastic to them. I mean, I, you know, I, I kind of keep them, I keep it real. Um, I never, I'm never, I don't blow smoke up anybody's butt like, Oh yeah, you can run this. I, it's definitely real. And I, I actually, uh, channel my club coach, Joe McNichol. So I coach them very similarly to how I was coached by Joe. Um, it's about being honest. It's about having a conversation. It's about treating my high school athletes with respect. Um, we have conversations. I talk about, you know, I want to know what their goals are. I want to tell them what I think that their potential is. And we sort of meet in the middle. Um, I let them have input, um, a lot of the times and, um, and I bring snacks. Oh, that's all. That's awesome. Snack. So has, those. has your philosophy on training distance runners changed? Cause I know like now there seems to be a lot more on like rest. Like when I was in high school, it was just hard, hard, hard every single day. Wow, now I, I feel you. like coaches are actually using days to incorporate rest and you don't have to run like your slower runs stay slower. You don't have to race the last three miles of, of your distance. Run. Like, so has that changed with you or have you always been kind of of that mind frame or do you still have that, that old school mentality? Like, we're just going to work, 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 work every day. No, I, I keep Joe's mentality and also the Villanova kind of training model, which was like, I do a prep day. So like Monday's a prep, if the hard workout's on Tuesday, Monday's a prep day. So we'll, you know, we'll do some intervals, but you know, I have to yell at them at like, this is the prep day, not the workout, you know, try to slow them down a little bit. And, uh, and they, and they learn. And then, so workout on Tuesday, easy day, you know, um, on Wednesday or whatever. So we do kind of like that, that same kind of model of, of hard, easy, hard, easy. And like I said, I like the prep days. Um, you know, the hardest thing is I have a small team now. So, um, the kids that aren't as talented as some of the other kids, they work all the time to try to stay up with the group. Um, so it's kind of like talking to each kid about, you know, where they are realistically, um, and just encouraging them to be the best runner they can be um you know and just again with small numbers it's tough it is. um and then also finding somebody with my top guy who's going to run with my top guy i don't i'm not in the position to hire um assistant coaches to run with my kids and i know that's another thing that's done a lot there's so many teams that have like more assistant coaches than they have actual kids on the team and they're brought on to work out with the kids and to make sure they have a hard workout and to create training partners. And I'm not good enough to run with the kids anymore. They don't want to run with me anyway. I'm their coach. Um, so that is another struggle that I have too, is just um, that training partners. Uh, you know, I have a, a top girl and a top boy and a lot of space in between. So that's the value of having those college kids come back and you know, fresh <laughs> off 22, they're seniors, they graduate. They're still looking for their first job. Like, it's like, Hey, volunteer. you want, you want you want to come and do some intervals with my top guy. You Absolutely. were fast in college. Come on. I'll, you could be a coach. Just go do the workouts. I tell you to do. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of neat though. Cause I had uh, the, my one kid that graduated that's at Maryland and my son was at Monmouth and they um, both ran together at, at the same high school. And, um, and uh, they came at Christmas time and I put them through a little work 
workout. And then my high school kids like watched, they were just like, wow, like it was really cool. It was really incredible. And they were really nice to them and they talked and conversed. And so it was, that was really nice. And, yeah. uh, and I, I think it's good to see, um, for the high school kids to see what they can do. A lot of them, again, we talk about like, um, like a lot of kids don't want to do sports in college because they say it's like a job. It's too hard. You know, like, Oh, I don't want to run in college. It's yeah. like having a job. It is, you know, it, it's yeah. hard. Um, and, uh, and, but it's a lot easier. I think it's, a, it's a lot easier now in some ways. I mean, we would travel every weekend. We didn't have computers, you know, you had your backpack with your chemistry textbook and your English textbook, and you didn't even touch them when you were, you know, in the hotel. Um, now they're like, Oh, we don't want you to have classes on Friday because that's a travel day. And, you know, I mean, it's, I don't know what that was. Yeah, that's crazy. I, right? I, <laughs> no. What is that? That was that was your that was your teacher going. I don't care if you're an athlete in my class. <laughs> I don't care. You still have to do it. It's like, but my but the athletic director says you have to accept this. Here's I my nose and it's so big. NCAA's representing like, a, your school. <laughs> I'm allowed to miss for today. I promise. Yeah. I don't care. Hey, I, the athletic <laughs> department tries this all the time. It's like I, I, exactly. I just yeah. want to go run. Oh no, but God. I. <laughs> I do and, love when kids get to see like like you know someone who who was in their position at their high school yeah. come back and we had on Clayton Murphy and yeah. what he does yeah. is so cool he goes to random high schools by, by where he lives and he works out on the track and he'll say you know like hey I'm doing 400 repeats where's your top guys 200 meters you know run me through this and that's yeah. such a great way to help build the actual sport too you know to see these these pro athletes and I mean. Clayton's great. He's on social media. He's great. Clayton. You know, he's yeah. calling out the, the, the USA TF all the time, rightfully so. But you know, like things like like that, just what that means for that high school kid to to see how Clayton Murphy works, it's pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we. I, I always said we need to make events out of when you know the you know male and female pros like they should go do what Clayton does. Go to high schools, announce they're going to be there. Let people see how hard you work. Yeah. Let people see what a pro workout is, and you know what they can be, and then sign some autographs. And you know, I I put on my Facebook the other day what how fast Sydney McLaughlin was running for her four hundred meters. That it was seventeen and a half miles for her four hundred the whole time. Like. Well, people don't realize how fast they are. And that I just think they need to see it in person just Absolutely. to see like this person isn't competing. They're working out and this is how fast they are. Like it's a different animal it really is. I, and I agree with Dave. It would be great for the sport. And just like your athlete seeing two college kids working out is yeah. a lot faster in that. Imagine the pro level like it would. I feel like that would be awesome. Yeah, it is. It, it is really neat. I mean, I, I would go to the track back in the day when I was faster and still, uh, trying to run local five K's and stuff. And, yeah. and, um, and it would be great just to have kids be, you know, what are you doing? And, you know, I mean, they didn't really know who I was. They didn't even care, but, uh, you know, I know what it was like to just watch Mary Slaney on the track. I would secretly be timing her, you know, she doing her two hundreds in, you know? And yeah. Oh I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really great. And like I said, we had Cindy Marie come back to the track of Villanova. So it was, it was great having him at the track and seeing him. Um, I don't know if you, th um, we had uh, Wellington Zaza. Um, I don't know if you know who he is, but he was at, um, he went to three different schools in Pennsylvania, but he finished up at Garnet Valley. Oh. And then my four by four at, when I was coaching Garnet Valley got to stand on the podium at Penn Relays cause he won the 400 meter hurdles. So um, he had come back to the school, to, worked with them on starts and stuff like that. And, um, you know, it, it, they just were, they were just blown away. He brought like, he was at uh, Auburn for a while. He brought like shirts to, you know, he That's had really little competitions cool. and really cool, really cool. It matters. It matters. All that stuff matters. So I want to talk about an award that you won twice while you were over at Villanova. Um, it was known as the Broadwick Award when you won it, but it's the Honda Sports Award. Mm -hmm. uh, for people that don't know what it is, uh, talk about what that award is. So the Honda Sports Award is um, given to um, a top female athlete in, I think, 12 D1 sports. So um, it's like swimming, gymnastics, volleyball, basketball. I'm going to miss them. They're like cross country, track. Um, golf, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure I'm not going to be able to name them all because I'm on the spot right now, but, uh, and they also have an inspiration reward and they give out a, a D2 and a D3 athlete award. Um, and then 
they they all win for their specific um, sport. And then uh, usually at the end of June every year, they bring the, these female athletes together and they are um, a, a top award of all these top women is is voted on. And that is presented this year. It was Caitlin Clark um, from Iowa. Iowa. Um, and I had the honor of being there as an alum and and meeting all these female athletes and it was just um such a pleasure they if if the future of our young girls if they come across any of these women in their sport in their lifetime in any capacity sport i mean we are they're they're blessed these women were, are, are amazing um so it's like the heisman trophy but it's for all sports, all sports. and nobody knows about it which is a bummer. And I was going to say, it is not brought up enough. And you mentioned Caitlin Clark. And it's like, how hard is it to mention? She was all over SportsCenter, all over ESPN, one of the most well-known names in female sports right now. And how hard was it to mention, oh, yeah, she just beat out 11 other elite athletes to win the, one of the most prestigious awards in collegiate sports for females. Like, and and it, this was not a given. I mean, we we were like, oh, maybe it's going to be um, – uh, well, Caitlin oh. Tui was there, right? Caitlin Tui was not there, but she was one of the award winners. Well, yeah. um, the uh, the golfer Rose Yang. Yeah, I I'm looking at it right now. Win. Yeah, you know, Rose was incredible. Yeah, and then you had Aaron Matson, who just got um, named as a 22 year old the head coach of UNC field hockey. Are you kidding me? Like, yeah. you know, and we know Aaron, so we were you know secretly pulling for her. But um, yeah, I was just like, who's going to win this? Like, it was, and and it, they're amazing. All of them are amazing. So we definitely need to give more shout outs to this. And especially as talking in ovals goes, we will pay attention, especially to the cross country and track and field athletes and give them shout outs because it's something that, you know, if any female athletes are listening to this, go look it up, go support your fellow females, especially, and, you know, give them shout outs and make sure that people know about this. Because I have to say, before I looked it up, I really didn't know about this either. And I've loved sports my whole freaking life. Uh, You know, it's something, and it's a shame that this is highlighting 12 of the best collegiate athletes in the country it'll be 50 in three years it'll be a 50 year birthday of the honda sports award that's crazy. 50 years that's 50 crazy. years of nobody knowing that this is going on <laughs> so so what was, what was the feeling for you when you were named a winner and you know your collect in your sport what was that like uh, well, definitely an honor. It was it was handled a little differently. They brought us in right around the same time they were doing at the same time. There was a, the NCAA convention, I think. Mm-hmm. So um, the highlight, it was l- less kind of like specifically highlighted. Now it's it's really they make a big production. It's it's televised. Um, it's it's amazing. Um, so I think I was a little bit in all. We didn't get a chance to meet all the other winners. You, we kind of went in. You were on a panel. They awarded you the cup and then then I think, you know, I had to fly home and go to a track meet or something like that. So, um, (laughs) you know, it was really quick, but I do, I mean, I have that cup downstairs in my basement and I have my plate and, um, looking back now, every time I go back, I went back for the 40th. I was back, uh, just a couple weeks ago for the 47th. I'll go back for the 50th. And every time I go, I'm more humbled and honored to be one of the cup winners. So. I wonder how many women were back to back like you were in 88 and 89, because that seems like it's a difficult thing to be recognized. Two I think and I was wrong. I was track and then I was cross country. So it was actually That's two awesome. separate sports. That's still yeah. awesome, though, to be recognized back to back. So definitely yeah. something, Dave, we need to be on a mission. We need Absolutely. to be looking out for this because it's definitely something that, uh, you know, I think would only help grow to sport to, you know, get the exposure to our amazing athletes. So before we go. Last thing I want to ask you, we ask all of our guests, if we were to hand you a magic wand and you could wave your wrist and fix the sport of track and field in order to make it more popular, make it lucrative, get athletes like yourself who were an amazing athlete paid properly at the pro level, what would you do to fix it? I had one of my clients ask me this. He's a steeplechaser that just left, uh, graduated from UPenn. He's doing a fifth year at Duke. We think that there should be a Netflix series Ooh. about track and field and take five athletes, have a multi-eventer, have a distance runner, have a, you know, in all, and make it like, make a little 
uh, lifetime kind of movie about their training towards the goal, like Olympics or world champs or whatever, and, and real life experiences and what they go through and what their training's like and have one be like a mom, you know, or, you know, or a husband, it can't be easy to be, you know, to have a child regard, have one being, you know, a full time in med school or have real life stories of athletes that have actually done this. And maybe you have to glamorize it a little bit, but um, I think it would take, it would bring a lot of attention to, to the daily life of what these athletes really go yeah. through. I got to okay. say, as, as pissed as I was that the Nationals were only on CNBC, yeah. you know, uh, that, that really pissed me off. I did think that the coverage was better. I liked how yeah. they had some, some, some pre some split screens, or neither that, or like they interviewed Ryan Krauser prior to him throwing. They interviewed Rob Benjamin warming up, right. like you know. I love when Ryan Krause talked. He's like these other throwers think I'm crazy talking. I know. Like, right now, <laughs> he, had he has a good personality. They need to do but more. It's like, but it's you know, like because no, the only time you ever hear these these athletes get interviewed is after their event and they're exhausted and you <clears throat> interview them like <laughs> five seconds after, you know. So like, I thought that was cool, and I do like yes how they had the split screen. You know, I yes, I love that they're doing a pull vault or jab, but I don't want to miss three laps of the 10 K or the five K. You know, a lot like, can so, happen in those three laps, right? Yes. It's like, you know, well, yeah, well, you absolutely. Gotta, you gotta make a move. So I definitely thought that the coverage was better. I agree. Um, but I mean, how it, it wasn't was prime now. time. I mean, put it on, you know, on NBC, time. like it has been every other year, you know, yeah. I mean, or yeah. like all these paywalls, like you got to pay for Peacock or flow sports or, you know, like it's hard for the average person. All right. They're like, all these great runners are running in this meet. Where can I find this? Yeah. And, you know, but I blame a lot of the athletes too, because it's hard to promote when you don't know if they're going to show up for a race or, you know, like if, if they're going to pull out of an event. So it's, it's, it's hard for sponsorships, I guess, to get behind it in that sense. When like, all right, like Sydney is going to run this, 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 and this, and then she can't run or something like that. Cause there are a lot more injuries in this sport too. So it yeah. is hard to, predict but the usatf can do a much better job of getting these athletes out there and just putting things in layman's terms like you know like have someone actually hold a shot put and be like wow this thing is 16 pounds and this, this guy's throwing it 70 he throws it over 20 yards on a football field every time that's a good way to put it people don't realize he his world record is right around 25 yards a 16 pound ball he threw it 25 yards most people can't throw a regular football no exactly they, they they don't even know i also think like and you brought up a good you uh, a point of you know people aren't what are you not interested if uh, Sydney McLaughlin is going to drop out I mean I and maybe it's just because I was that person like my first and you asked me previous like a, a while ago about my first NCAA championship I had the slowest time going into that race I was on the banked track on the very 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 tippy top almost falling over the edge and they were all looking at me like who's this girl you know my <laughs> PR was like nine seventeen and I came out and I won with a nine oh six you know, on, uh, in Oklahoma city in, in the myriad convention center or whatever. So, and I remember being out at one of the Olympic trials and there was a guy in the 800 and I was like, is that guy wearing a t-shirt from American Eagle? And sure enough, he was running in a t-shirt from American Eagle. Didn't have a sponsorship. He was coaching a D three college. Nobody knew about him. And, and those are the stories I love. I love when oh, you're there that listen. person that just has worked yeah. their ass off to be there and they make it. The men's hurdle, the guy from D two D just yeah. missing winning was Unbelievable. And he has a great career ahead of him because he is he was selling cell phones took fifth in the long jump, too. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I do have to say, you I think your idea was beaten. You had to talk to Steeplechaser. Noah Lyles announced uh on July 5th. Uh yeah, July 5th. Dude, he's doing a docuseries with NBC Olympics. Uh, really? Noah Lyles, yeah. Uh him game up follow, and, yeah. and NBC Olympics, they're working on a docuseries. Okay. Uh, that'll be coming out. So that could be a good first step to exactly what you were saying. And it's a good guy to start with. Noah Lyles is his amazing personality, yeah. world champion, uh, really good chance at repeating back at Worlds. So I think that's a good first step. Now, here's what we need though. We all need to rally around this because it's fine for him to make this docu series, but if, watch. but if the own community does not watch and not even just watch it, hype it up, yep. talk about it, get it out on social media. You know, coaches like you getting out there and going to your sprinters and saying, "Watch this." Go like it. It takes all of us because yep. the one thing that and Dave, you were kind of correct, I think, with the athletes. It's fine for you know promoters to do what they need to do, but who's the who's one of the greatest UFC fighters of all time? Conor McGregor. Why? Because he promoted himself. 
constantly. Yeah. We always knew when Connor was fighting because he made sure we knew. Athletes are so quiet in track and field. Who knows? The distance where runners are quiet. This is right. But even the sprinters, how are all the sprinters? That's why I love Ingerbritson because he's. I love Ingerbritson. Sh- you know, Shikari. That people. Shikari right now is in a great mindset. And I think what she's doing right now is amazing with the way she's talking and things like no, that. She blew off the, the uh, media, but I'm. Whatever. Yeah, you don't blow off the media. They're your bread and butter. <laughs> I'm fine with that because what has the media done besides? Okay, sorry about that. Mm. She's not wrong because besides every four you're right, years, you're right. what does the media do for runners? Unless you're, right. you're Usain Bolt, nothing. Right. And Shikari Richardson is amazing. And you know what the last time the media talked to her was? Why did you smoke weed when your grandma died right before a race? That's right. what I would blow off the media too, okay? Right, that's true. She's, but, she's, she's got a reason to be salty, that's for sure. So we, I think we need more athletes to say, I'm going to be at this race when they know they are going to be there, start promoting themselves. Absolutely. I'm going to be there and get together. You know, even if you don't like each other with Noah Lyles and Aaron and Aaron Knight, and I don't know if Aaron Knight and Noah Lyles are friendly, but if they know they're going to the same meet, do a promo together. Like you want to see us go at it, come to this meet, be here. It'll be on flow track. Go get your flow track <laughs> subscription. Go get, do something, make it, make it fun for people. Not that we have to guess who's going to be at freaking meets. So I the kids are watching them, Dave. I don't know about you. My kids are watching that stuff. I mean, they, they are. are like, no, they are. It's this generation of high school kids. They know they're more, watching. They know more about pros than a lot of people my age do. Yeah. You know, and, or even did when when I was in high school, you know, in the 90s. I mean, well, we had to wait I, for the publications to come out like two weeks after. A, a oh, meet. Listen, I mean, it was all track and field news or you know, yep. things like that, you know, which I mean, now that like kids like. You waited for a magazine once a month. Yeah. yeah. And I checked every ranking in high school yeah. because I was that nerd. <laughs> you know, I had I, I had Ed Scullions and Ed Grants. That's where I was. Yeah. And it was websites on AOL. And I was didn't, I didn't have modem. websites. I had it, but I was hoping that little dude started to run on AOL. Because if he ran, then I knew I was good. I knew I was probably getting in. Then Ma picked up the phone and I was pissed. <laughs> so, Vicky, I have um one more thing because I love it. Alex's on the fence, the lights in the Diamond League. I think that's great for average fans to be able to see the the, the pace of how fast everyone's running. Oh, oh, around the track, the yeah. the, the record light. You yeah. don't like that, Alex? I think if a record is threatened, fine. If not, turn it off. Because to me, it is the highlighter behind the hockey puck right now. It's yeah. a good thing to try, but like it. it's it's it's. I, you, and again, I just think we're so desperate. It's the NFL right? first down mark. Like that I changed think- NFL. You but know? the first down marker is not a record setting thing. It's you got it. Move on. You know, it's like, I don't know. I think we're just so starved for anything. And I was happy with the NBC did. They're finally putting miles per hour in a box. I thought that was great. Yeah. You, you the, did, heart the heart rate. The heart rate. Heart rate. Yes, I did. Yeah, that was interesting. They're doing but like, but That's sometimes fine. it's sometimes the competition is about the competition. And exactly. and and it was about making the world team. Yes. So especially when you have trials and finals, you don't. The goal oh, is not a world record. I don't want lights there. I'm talking about like Diamond League meets where yes. like every, oh, everyone's yes. going for the world record. But no, like, like U.S. Nationals, Worlds, uh, Olympics. Yeah. No, no there's lights. Diamond League meets. Absolutely. I think it's I think it makes for, you know, and you play there at night. So. I love watching Inger Britson go for the two mile record. Yes. I'm like, oh, he's ahead. He's ahead of pace. He's ahead. And <laughs> even my, my fiance is like, he's ahead of the lights. Yeah. Like, yeah, <laughs> then then you don't need a rabbit, right? right? They should have the ability to right. turn it on and off. I think, you know, even at a oh, national meet, if somebody, if a thing Mo is at a national meet, looking to break a national record, fine, turn the lights on. Right. Turn them on in the middle and let a thing chase it or let it chase a thing. You know what I mean? But I don't know. I don't think they're in necessity just because Jacob, uh, Jakob Ingerbertson's in a race. We shouldn't need the lights on. Right. Like, you know what I mean? So I don't know. It's, it's a good first step. I'll give it to him. It's a good step. <laughs> We're so starved for anything. We just want anything as track fans. Like us. Like our sport. Please watch us. Uh, anyway, Vicky, thank you so much for coming on. This was such a fun show. Yeah, you guys. Thanks for having me. We Wonderful. truly appreciate it. Dave, you have anything last before we hop out of here? I just love, you know, that we have, you know, last week we had on a high school junior going into her senior year. Now we have on Vicky Huber, who had one of the best storied careers of any distance runner in our country. It's just cool that this sport can offer so many different perspectives and so many different views. And it, it was just, it was an, it was an honor having one, you know, I remember watching you race when, uh, 
when I was in high school and it was just, it was wonderful. It was Thank you. And I, and wonderful. the thing about the sport is, you know, I've been running for 42 years. I'm 56. I've been running for 42 years and that's what I want. The kids I coach and the kids that I talk to uh, my own kids is that this is a sport you do for life. You can do for life and it's a love and a passion and, and, and track and field still love it. I have a passion for it. And it's just, it's, it's, it can be a lifestyle and, um, and, and it, it keeps you healthy. So it does. Vicki, give your high school a shout out. Give them some love. Where are you coaching? I coach at Sun Valley in Aston, Pennsylvania. Um, I did coach at Garnet Valley um, High School where my kids went to school. And then I've switched to Sun Valley and we're kind of rebuilding the program there. So we've already replaced some records on the record board awesome. at Sun Valley. So that's been really exciting and, and uh, it's a good challenge. Great, Great. kids. So again, thank you so much. Uh, she's Vicki Huber Rudowski. She is a two-time Olympian, eight-time NCAA champion, United States champion, uh, a resume, a pioneer trailblazer for a lot of women that are running today. Um, so pay homage if you can. Go say hello if on social media if you find her. And uh, definitely everyone look out for the Honda Sport Award and go support it. Uh, support the women in collegiate sports because they deserve it. Um, like, share, follow, subscribe, rate five stars here. If you enjoyed it, uh, spread a word of mouth. Find us on the socials at Talking and Ovals and send us your PBs. I don't care if you're just running a 5K and on the road and you run 42 minutes and you ran 41. Send it to us. We want to know. We want to give you a shout out because running is like that. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. We will be back next week. So long.